So welcome to Ecology and Physiology at Cypress College. So this will be week one, lecture one. So every lecture I'm going to give you some type of overview of what we're doing today. So here you see it. Also, if there turn out to be objectives that you should be learning, I'll also list them here. These are actually what I will end up testing you on. So if you don't see a list or it's not listed, it's something that you don't need to know for a test. So I should probably introduce myself. Um, Eric Brothwell, I have two master's degrees, so if you call me doctor, that's incorrect. Um, professor or mister is fine. I'm a traveler. You can see my schedule. I'm kind of all over the place. Um, I have to make a schedule so I can understand what I'm doing. Um, you're always free to email me if you have questions um, for student hours. So it's going to be right after class on Tuesdays, but I'm we're waiting for when... I'm officially allowed to start doing that because there's some negotiations going on. In terms of my background, um, I'm a bio person through and through. I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Both my masters are from Long Beach. The first one's in science ed. The second one was in biology. I taught high school for 14 years, which will probably explain why I do things the way I do. <clears throat> These are the courses I taught. I had AP Bio, Physiology, Biology, Chemistry, Physics, Earth Science. I also had Physical Science, which was an integrated science. I also taught AP Research. And when I did my biology research, it was in plant molecular genetics. And in particular, it's like the physiology side of it. And I taught physiology a lot, so I think in terms of physiology quite often. So in class, you're going to do an an introductory card. Then we should probably talk about your grades. So obviously I'm not going into lots of detail here. More of it will be in class, but we'll have three exams. So 50 points each. We'll talk about that in a moment. We will have um, two lab exams for 50 points each. We'll have a research project that will have 165 points total. So it's the biggest single component to your grade. In, on this calendar here on the right, you can see all the green highlights. That's where the project kicks in. The dates are wrong. I'm going to have this corrected for in class. But down here at the bottom, you can actually see the updated timeline for the research project. And it's going to take us all semester to get through this. <clears throat> and you can see that you know, you're going to have progress along the way, a feedback, giving a proposal. You're going to turn in an outline for for credit, a draft for credit, a final paper for credit. We're also going to be doing a poster presentation, so you have that for credit, a draft, and the final poster. And again, all this is laid out on the calendar. I might end up changing the date of final presentations because we're going to see if we can make it match with some of the other classes, but we're not entirely sure. We're also going to have um, a total of 14 labs that we're going to be doing, and you're going to be turning in brief little lab write-ups for each of those. I'm going to drop two of them, so, you know, they're just not great. Then we ignore it. And then in class, we have a whole bunch of miscellaneous activities and papers and stuff like that. That'll add up to being 40 points. So I give you learning objectives because I don't want you to be guessing as to what should be on a test because I hated when professors did that to me. I'll be explicit about what you need to know from each lecture, and that's the only thing that shows up on the exams. So obviously studying is an issue. We'll talk more about this in actual class instead of here on this abbreviated lecture video. But one of the best ways to learn something is to teach it, especially if you record yourself. It's awful if you record yourself. But what you'll notice is where you're struggling, and the struggle is telling you this is what you need to focus on. It's a horrible technique but it works. <clears throat> so the lecture is going to be meant to be interactive. Um, you know, it's just us in the class, so feel free to stop, interrupt. I'm going to ask questions. If we need to take side tangents, let's take those side tangents. It's okay. If you're going to be absent, let me know ahead of time, especially let your lab group know ahead of time, but, you know, we'll make it work. I also don't fill up the slides with writing because I and one of those people who writes all over things. So you should probably be doing that too. If you're being passive and just letting me talk at you or just only reading what's on the slides, that's not going to be helpful to you in the long term. 
you need to be active in your learning. For the lab, um, for the most part, it's like a one and done type deal, but some of them are going to keep going on for week after week after week. Um, the lab manual is free, so I have it a picture of it here. I'll be giving you handouts if you think you want them, or we'll just post everything online and just move from there. You're going to be turning in a PDF of just the ending of each lab, which is data analysis. Not the entire thing. You're not going to have to type it up. The only typing up is going to be for the formal lab report. And again, we're going to have two lab exams, which is basically, hey, can you do this lab again? We are also going to have two field trips during the course. They're going to be off campus. They're going to be February 9th and 16th. February 9th is actually going to be over here in this picture on the right, which is this one right here. We're going to go to the James Dilley Green Belt Preserve. And that's actually going to be where we're going to look at um, biodiversity. You have to pay to park there. I will pay for everyone's parking. You just need to get there. I will suggest carpooling. There, we're going to have field trip forms for all this. Um, we're going to go to this first and then come back to class. So I know that we won't. it's going to be a shortened day just because you all have to get from campus to down here, and then we have to make it all the way back up. I'll probably have some snacks and stuff like that down there too for us all. Then the following week, we're going to go to Bolsa Chica, which is closer to campus. It's this one right here. We're going to be going to the Ecological Preserve. We're going to be looking at resource, resource partitioning and how birds are dividing up what's available to them. And again, we're going to carpool, but this one's free to park. The exams are a necessary evil because we have to give you some type of grade. Um, we're going to have three, but I'm not going to intentionally make them cumulative. Some of this class naturally builds on itself, so like abiotic factors don't get to go away and some basic principles of physiology don't get to go away. So it will be cumulative, but it's not meant to be cumulative, if that makes sense. And again, the only thing that I test you on is what I give you in terms of the learning objectives. So you don't actually need to be hardcore reading everything and seeking out everything that you can find. We're also gonna, it's gonna be a combination of multiple choice and free response. I'm going to give you free response questions ahead of time and then you're just gonna be randomly given one. So you will know all the potential questions, at least free response wise ahead of time so you can prepare if you wish. If we don't have a final, we're gonna be just presenting our work. Lecture and lab are integrated in this course and that's because ecology and physiology are doing sciences. So ecology is meant to be done outside, not sit in a classroom. Physiology is meant to be done. It's not meant to be listened to. And ecology turns out to dictate how physiology behaves. So that's why we actually talk about ecology first, then we bring in the physiology. The order is actually important. So with ecology, since a simulation only can tell you so much, we need to go out and do some field work or do some long-term experiments. It's also why statistics is going to be a big deal in this class, and we're going to talk about that all on Thursday. And ecology is also really fun for long-term projects. And physiology is one of those where you can experience it, so that's why we will do that. And it, it does require some chemistry talk, so, you know, we'll hold your hands when it comes to the chemistry. In terms of how the course really integrates, what we'll see is how lecture and lab match up quite nicely. So like this Thursday, all in, we're doing in lectures talking about statistics, but the lab is all about statistics. So we're actually going to blend the lecture and lab time together so that it's not just lecture or lab, it'll be both. You could also see how I've color coded everything so like you could see how the labs end up matching up with each other. Sometimes they'll blend, sometimes they won't. So why this course? So this is the end of a three-course series that you have here at Cyprus for biology majors. So you start off in Bio 174 where you looked at cells and biochemistry and genetics and all that molecular stuff, which are underpinnings. But to put it all into perspective, that's what Bio 175 was for. <clears throat> so 
175 gave you perspective on cells and biochemistry and genetics in terms of talking about evolution and biodiversity. Because why have cells? What's evolution and biodiversity? Why have all that biochemistry? Because of evolution and biodiversity. Why genetics? Well, genetics is necessary for evolution and biodiversity. The last real pillar that we can fit into everything is actually this course. So why are genetics and evolution important? Because the environment changes. Why does the environment change? Why do you need to evolve? So that your physiology can deal with the environment. And you need to have the genetics to let your physiology function. So everything ends up integrating together. This course is actually kind of built and it's taken a while for us, we in biology, to get to this point. So in like the 19, in the 1700s, we started talking about cells and we started learning about anatomy. Then in the 1800s, we started figuring out ideas about evolution. Darwin wasn't the first, but he did the best job at explaining it. Also, genetics aren't coming in because that's when we had Gregor Mendel and we were still exploring more anatomy and a little bit of physiology. It was really in the 1900s when we started to start really exploring ecology. And then we started to realize, hey, we can kind of stick like genetics, ecology, and evolution together into this phenomenon that we call the modern synthesis. It's also when we really started to explore physiology. So there's a theme with all of this, and that is ecology, genetics, evolution. And what have you hit in every single one of your big three courses? Either ecology, genetics, or evolution. In reality, you hit all three always, but we make an explicit point of that. So why does this course matter? Well, easy example would be climate change. We've known about the climate change since the 1960s, although you could argue well before that, but there were people sounding the alarms in the 1960s. So it's not like we waited till the 1990s to start chiming up about this. And the thing with climate change is it's all about greenhouse gases. And greenhouse gases alter heat distributions. So this figure here shows how, for the most part in human history, these three particular greenhouse gases, so CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, N2O, have been relatively stable until recently when they start to spike up. And if we were to correlate that with temperature, we'd see a very strong correlation. We'll talk about correlations next time. So the real good correlation seems to be these go up, heat goes up. But what does it matter if heat goes up? Well, heat on Earth is not the same. We have differential heating. And that differential heating means that the environment is changing differently depending on where you're located. That ends up giving us different selective pressures. And we don't know if the physiology of organisms can keep up. And that's kind of a problem. So an example of this would be we are adding heat to the oceans, and that heat is coming from CO2, and CO2 can dissolve in water. So it turns out oceans are a huge reservoir of CO2. So because of this principle that we call Le Chatelier's principle, you should have learned that in chemistry at some point. If not, it's okay. It's a, it's a balancing problem. CO2 can be dissolved to form acid, which is this equation right here. That's basically what it's saying. Water plus CO2 equals acid inside of, you know, the water. Well, who cares? Well, if we acidify the oceans, some things can do well with that acidic environment and some things don't. There is some evidence, but it's not as conclusive as people would like to claim it is, that sea jellies seem to really thrive in acidic environments, which means we would be seeing more sea jellies. Are we seeing that? Yes. Is that because they're thriving in the acidic environment, or is it because the acidic environment is killing off their predators? Okay, you got me. But we're seeing a change in biodiversity. Is anything else suffering? Well, anything that has calcium carbonate is suffering, so anything that makes a shell or anything that makes you know, a limestone-style structure like 
corals. This figure here is actually the reaction in terms of, or the physiology of how coral gets made, or at least the, the calcium carbonate backbone of coral gets made. The catch is, and you see I have these two blue arrows in here, when we acidify the ocean, these reactions reverse. So this first reaction here, this top one, when we add acid, we actually get, when we add CO2, which is adding acid, we kind of start to reverse this reaction, and the reversal of the reaction breaks apart the CaCO3, which is calcium carbonate, into calcium and carbonate ion. What does that mean? Adding acid decalcifies things that have calcium carbonate. And if that's your mode of protection, or that's your home, we're destroying the home. Well, what else happens? Well, if we're changing how we're heating up the environment, species still need to adapt to this, or they're going to die off. But if you can't, well, then clearly we're going to have a cascade. Because if you die off as a species, things that eat you or rely on you then start to die off, potentially, and we get a cascading effect. Well, one of the places that people have been studying this are actually in parasites of tropical plants in Africa, and we're noticing how some tropical parasites are dying off, and others are starting to thrive, <clears throat> because they have the genes to make it through whatever adaptations are necessary, or they don't. We also know that Changing this environment actually causes genes to get altered. It's called epigenetics, and that's what actually this table here is dealing with. This is from a review paper where you happen to have all these different species of plants, and the result of the stress, which you see in that third column, triggers this second column, this differential modification of the DNA. We're not changing the order of A's, T's, C's, and G's, what we're changing instead is whether or not those A's, T's, C's, and G's are functional or not. And that may or may not be a very big deal. So these are just some examples of what we're going to be doing in this class. Next time we're going to be dealing with statistics. We're not going to be doing any of the stats by hand. Um, you would do well to get a free account on a website called rstudio.cloud or bring in Excel and we're going to need to have some modification of Excel so you're definitely going to want to bring a computer next time and then you're going to do a little exit ticket on your way out.